Welcome to an Adventure Knox. In today's video, I'll provide you with a tweaked version of our two week itinerary traveling Madeira. If we were to redo this trip, this is how I'd do it. I'll give you a breakdown of accommodations, daily activities, costs, and my Google Maps making it easy for you to see where everything is in relation to one another. The itinerary. Three nights in Funchal, staying at Jacka Hostel in the city centre. Four nights in or near Arco de Calheta, we rented an Airbnb apartment here. Two nights in Sao Vicente, staying in the gorgeous Granny's farm in one of their well-appointed bell tents. And finally, five nights in Porto de Cruz, staying in the original Jacka Hostel, which, as well as being beautifully decorated, is a hive of socialising in the evening, making it easy to meet other travellers and friends. Day-to-day -day activities. Day one, Monday neighbourhood of Funchal. Wander along the Funchal promenade until you reach the Teleferico de Funchal. Take this cable car up the mountainside where you can soak up magnificent views of the sea, the residential neighbourhoods, the roads as they appear from and disappear back into tunnels again, and the city as a whole. At the top, there is the stunning Monte Palace Gardens with its hillside of flowers, tumbling waterfalls, its oriental design and fauna in the water, on land and in the air. Half a day to explore the gardens should suffice. Food inside is pricey, so you may wish to pop into a supermarket like Pingo Dos, which we loved to pick up a cheaper packed lunch. Exit the gardens through the entrance at the top and a minute or two's walk along the road will take you to the Funchal Wicker Toboggan. In the high season, you'll need to queue for a while, but it's an exhilarating ride where two men will steer you, sometimes spin you around if you seem up for it, and you'll be hurtling down the hill alongside cars. There's even one section where you meet a crossroads and someone will be there stopping traffic for you. Day two, downtown Funchal. Spend the morning exploring the center of the capital, either on your own or like we did as part of a free walking tour. The city has points of interest such as the Funchal Cathedral, complete with its intricate interior designs, the Mercado dos Lavradores, where you can see the traditional flower cellars and lesser known places like the English church, which have an interesting history. The afternoon can be spent on a food tour. Madeira is home to excellent traditional foods such as scabbard, a seemingly innocent fish on the plate, but slightly terrifying when you see it whole at the fishmongers. There's a plethora of fruits that grow naturally on the island, traditional biscuits and bolo de mel. There's also the divine Portuguese custard tart, and when it comes to drinks, there's the naturally sweet brisa, the very alcoholic puncher, and a tropical and cold Nikita too. Day three, South Coast sightseeing road trip. On this day, you'll be driving from Funchal to Arco de Calheta. Pick up a rental car from a downtown Funchal office and drive to some of the popular sightseeing spots. Nuns Valley is a small village that sits in the crater of an extinct volcano. It has an interesting history and today a short walk from a car park takes you to a breathtaking viewpoint, allowing you to look down into it, in the shadows of the volcano walls around it. Not too far from here is Cabo Girao. It's a skywalk that sits at 580 metres above sea level with a small section of the walkway made out of glass. You may be luckier than us as you meant to get spectacular views out across the southern part of the island but we mostly looked out onto cloud. There's a very touristy cafe here, otherwise bring a packed lunch. Not too far from here is the waterfall Cascata dos Anjos. Whilst Madeira is home to countless waterfalls, this one is quite special as it falls onto a tarmac road, meaning that you can drive your rental car through the waterfall, giving it a free car wash. It's easy to park up and get out on foot to get some unique photographs of this too. Day 4, 25 Fontes and its surrounding trails. 
get up early and set aside a full day for this one. Hike to 25 Fuentes and some of its surrounding trails. It's a popular route so an early arrival will allow you to enjoy the outwards walk in peace. The trail from the car park is predominantly downhill into a thick forested valley. Parts of the path follow along two different levadas and you will eventually be brought out into the waterfall area that gives it its name. 25 tiny waterfalls or fountains plunge into a gorgeous turquoise lake. Get there early enough and you might have it to yourself. The later it gets, the busier it becomes. As you hike back, take a 1.6 km detour out to the Risco waterfall. It's a 100 meter high vertical waterfall and a sight to behold. If you were able to bring a packed lunch, this is the perfect spot to enjoy it. Otherwise, hold on a bit longer until you reach the Rabasaur Cafe. If you're too tuckered out for an afternoon hike, you can either walk back along the tarmac road or pay a few euros for a minibus to return you to the car park at the top. But if, like us, you still have the energy, walk along the slightly undulating trail to Lagoa do Vento, a magnificent lake that cuts Frisco Waterfall into two sections. From here, the hike back to the car park's elevation is pretty gruelling, with what feels like an almost constant staircase. If you can tackle this, you'll be rewarded with a flat walk along the Alacrim Levada that will at times offer wonderful views across the valley that you hiked through earlier, and you'll see the Levada's man-made flume. Day five, Fanal Forest in Levada dos Cedros. To make up for the strenuous hike the previous day, you can have a lazy start and spend the late morning casually meandering around the Fanal Forest. The name was a bit of a head scratcher for me as it felt more akin to a field with some trees in it, but there was no getting away from how eerie yet stunning it was. It's a bit of a photographer's dream and we spent more time here than the average tourist would. There's a few picnic areas, so I'd recommend eating here before moving on to the afternoon's activities, but there's nowhere to purchase food, so bring your own. In the afternoon, Drive to the Corral Falso Trailhead for the Levada do Cedros walk. It is minutes down the hill. By starting here, you can skip the few hundred metres of elevation that you tackled by starting at Fanel. For us at least, this trail started off in fog with lots of autumnal orange leaves, despite it being the height of summer. You may get lucky with the viewing platform. We didn't, but the closer to the waterfalls you get, the more tropical it begins to feel. There's a range of waterfalls clustered together, but take it easy as the ground is very slippery. Don't continue uphill after the waterfalls as there's nothing notable to see. Instead, hike back to the trailhead. Day six, Levada Nova and Levada Moinho. Most Levada walks act as a there and back, but these two Levadas on Madeira are incredibly close to one another, allowing you to create a circular hike. Begin by walking from the free parking spots outside of the Lombarda Church to the Levada Nova. This allows you to get the uphill climb out of the way before the heat of the day comes out. The newer Levada has some impressive drops, but with the railings, there's the feeling of safety allowing you to soak in the views that it affords. There's a slightly long tunnel, so a head torch isn't a bad idea and it pushes you out into a canyon with one of the prettiest situated waterfalls that I have seen in a long time. Both the Levada and Trail take you behind the waterfall, so prepare to get a tiny bit wet. Shortly after the waterfall, a staircase leads off the Levada Nova down to Levada Moinho, and there's a lovely picnic area. There's nowhere to buy food, so ensure you take a packed lunch. The return along Moinho is a bit more overgrown but features cute stepping stones, a smaller waterfall where a man-made roof protects you, and plenty of flora and fauna. Day 7, West Coast Sightseeing Trip On this day you'll be driving from Arco de Calheta to São Vicente. After three days of hiking your body will be grateful for today's car-centric activities. Start your morning at the Miradouro do Fio, a beautiful cliff-top vantage point. 
From here it's a short walk or an even shorter drive to the Ponte do Pargo lighthouse where you can gain a slightly different vantage of the coast. It's then a short drive to the Miradoro da Garganta Funda which I expect is more impressive in winter and spring. Then take the longer and windy drive up to Porto Monige. There's plenty of options for lunch here and it's most famous for its volcanic pools. The town has both free to access fully natural pools as well as ones that you can pay to access and have some human interference to make it easier to get in and out. Had our car not broken down on this day which led to time being taken away, we'd also have visited the Vue de Nueva which is a spectacular view out onto a waterfall that drops into the ocean. Day 8 Sunrise and Levara Faja do Rodriguez. Wake up early and head to Bica de Cana for a secluded sunrise. Pack a breakfast to enjoy as the sun comes up. Whilst Ponte de San Lorenzo and Pico do Arriero may get the sunrise attention on the island of Madeira, Bica de Cana throws a real punch with views out onto the highest mountains and a good chance of seeing a cloud inversion, but without the crowds. Next, drive to the Faja do Rodriguez Levada Trailhead. It's an easy 8km there and back walk if you stop just before the 1km long tunnel, which you have to bend over for on what makes it officially a moderate to difficult hike. The trail up to this point shows off gorgeous flora, not one, not two, but three different waterfalls at the entrance to the tunnel, and then a couple of other viewpoints out across Sao Vicente. If you follow our steps and stay at Granny's farm, make lunch here and spend the afternoon relaxing in the pretty and tranquil gardens. Day 9. Santana Houses, Balcos and Boca do Risco. On this day, you'll be driving from Sao Vicente to Porto da Cruz. Begin by driving to Santana for a quick stop to look at the Santana Houses, the traditional build of homes in Madeira. Allow five or so minutes here, Next, drive on to Balcos, a short, flat Livara meander that pops you out onto a viewing platform giving spectacular views up onto Pico do Arriero and out towards the coast. Close to Balcos are a couple of poncha bars and restaurants if you don't fancy another packed lunch. In the afternoon, drive and park up just past the Teleferico da Faja do Lorano on the outskirts of Porto da Cruz and hike along the Boca do Risco coastal trail. If it's not an overcast day, you'll want plenty of water and sunscreen as the hike is exposed in places, offering terrific views back onto Porto de Cruz and eastwards towards the Dragon's Tail. Day 10, Pico do Arriero for a sunrise and then hike to Pico Ruivo. Today will be a biggie. Set your alarm for an early start and I'd advise arriving at the car park at Pico do Arriero for about half an hour before the sunrise to allow time to park and find a spot to sit down. Take breakfast and set off on the 14 km round trip hike. It begins crossing the tops of mountains and in some sections the width of the path is all there is with drop-offs on either side. Next you'll begin the descent. It's 300 metres down on the way out, before being pushed through tunnels which act as both shortcuts and also a welcome cool down if, like us, you're hiking in the summer. You'll be walking through lovely flora and if you're lucky you might spot adorable fauna and the views are unbeatable. Approximately 4 kilometres in you'll begin the uphill climb. The first part is undoubtedly the most gruelling with steep ladders or equally steep steps cut into the hillside to get you over the pass. On the other side of the pass, it's still mostly uphill, but the gradient is far more forgiving. Point three of a kilometre before the peak, you'll reach a shelter house where you can buy drinks and snacks, though it was heaving in the height of summer. Outside there's a barbecue area where you can fill up with water and public toilets too. From here the path curves around Pico Ruivo offering phenomenal views out onto the Paul de Serra as well as the north and south coasts of the island. The peak has a trig point and allows you to look back to where you came from. This was an 
arduous hike in the summer heat and plenty of protection from the sun, water and food is vital. Day 11, Levara Dore. After the gruelling hike the day before, your body will be grateful for the practically flat, very shaded and relatively short Levara Dore walk. After a lie-in and a lazy start, you could eat lunch in the restaurant at the trailhead. The hike is one of the best for flowers. The variety found at the trailhead far surpasses others, and the wild crocosmias keep appearing many kilometres along the Levada. There's odd breaks in the foliage giving views out onto the densely forest-covered mountains. The trail has playful elements such as stepping stones, optional ladders, and the hike showstopper, the waterfall that you have to walk behind. Day 12, Levara do Caldeirao Verde. Set an early alarm to beat the crowds as this Levara walk is one of Madeira's most popular. Ensure you have some coins as this is one of the few trailheads that will charge for parking. The trail starts at the Quimaras Forest Park. It's a chocolate box setting with a coffee shop and a large museum sporting pretty thatched roofs. It's an almost flat 13 kilometers there and back trail to the Caldeirao Verde, or add on another 4.4 kilometers there and back to reach the Caldeirao do Inferno. The trail will take you through the Laura Silva Forest, past smaller waterfalls, through long and winding tunnels to so have a flashlight at the ready and at parts the foliage will thin out, providing sensational views out across the valley. Either take lunch and eat it at the waterfall like we did, or if you hike fast, you could buy food at the coffee shop at the trailhead, and there's paid for toilets here too. Day 13, Punta de São Lorenzo. Pack your swimmers and a towel into your day pack, and today drive to the trailhead of Punta de São Lorenzo. It's a six kilometre there and back trail to the sardine house along the recommended trail. Though, another trail continues behind this for spectacular views out onto the lighthouse if you still have the energy. The paths are well maintained due to the area's popularity, but they are undulating. The peninsula is subjected to northern winds, which along with a semi-arid climate have created a very low vegetation and in turn give phenomenal vistas. There are a handful of wild swimming spots along the trail and in the summer, the waters were warm and home to plenty of sea life. The rocky swim areas have helpful ladders allowing for a safe and easy exit. On our visit, the trailhead had expensive food vans and a port a Lunch can be purchased at the sardine house and toilets are located here too. Otherwise, there are plenty of picnic benches for a packed lunch. Day 14. Levara do Castellejo. The trailhead for this hike is minutes in the car from the Jaca Hostel in Porto de Cruz. If you've got a flight later in the day, this is a perfect walk to undertake as the drive won't take you any further away from the airport and it's an easy, flat walk so you won't build up much of a sweat. Unlike the other Levada walks in this itinerary, Levada do Castellejo gets you up, close and personal with the villages and the homes of locals. You'll see their animals and the crops that they grow in their gardens. Whilst there's plenty of pretty flora to enjoy, it's not as dense as other Levadas, so the trail affords sensational views out onto Eagle Rock and the coastline. Later along the trail, you'll be pushed up into an expansive valley. Much of this next section is not too dissimilar to other trails on this itinerary, finishing with a bouncy suspension bridge. The costs. If you were to structure this trip as suggested, based on the costs of my own trip, it should come to around about £1,300 per person based on two people sharing accommodation and transportation costs. For us, the biggest costs were by far the flights, which is to be expected when flying to a popular family holiday destination and peak school holidays, and also the car rental. The latter caught us off guard and it turns out that since Covid they've struggled to get enough rental cars to supply the demand so prices are high. To try and offset these costs we stayed in lower cost lodgings. 
The accommodations all had cooking facilities, so a mixture of making meals for yourself and eating out will keep the costs lower than eating out every day. Finally, as the trip had a heavy focus on hiking, the activities cost was very low. My Google Maps. The Google Map you've seen me using in this video is linked in the description below. Hopefully it will come in handy if planning your own trip. If you found this video helpful or just enjoyable, I'd be most grateful if you consider hitting the like button as it will help the video spread to others. And if you've not already done so, you may wish to check out my Madeira vlog series, so do feel free to click on the playlist to see more.